Maureen Farrow has been a staff writer at CNN Money, covering Wall Street and the stock and bond, bond market since August 2011. Uh, at CNN Money, she contributes articles, videos, and one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews with key newsmakers in the finance and business world. Uh, prior to joining CNN Money, she spent five years at Forbes magazine. There, she covered Wall Street and the technology sector with a focus on internet startups. She was the host of a weekly video series airing on the Forbes Video Network called Breakout that profiled game-changing entrepreneurs. She also served as a regular contributor to cable news outlets, including MSNBC, CNBC, and CNN. Uh, she started her business journalism career at the Financial Times, um, and uh, she's a graduate of Duke University and the Columbia School of Journalism, and is expecting in February, but she will not tell us whether it's a boy or girl. Let's give a Benedictine welcome to Maureen Farrell. Hi, thank you, thank you all so much for being here. Thanks for that introduction, Nick. And thank you so much for having me. Thanks to you, thanks for the, to the faculty and staff here at St. Vincent College. It's such a beautiful uh, place, and I have to thank you not, all f not only for coming out tonight, but um, also with your team in the National League uh, playoffs. I'm a Mets fan, so I can respect how long you all had to wait to <laughs> have this happen. Um, so it gives us Mets fans a lot of hope. <laughs> Um, so, as, as Nick said, my name is Maureen Farrell. I'm a staff writer at CNN Money. I cover Wall Street, the big banks, the stock market, and the bond market. So tonight, I'm here to talk to you about what's been called the bond bubble. And it's that second word, specifically bubble, that I've spent a lot of time over the last five years covering, specifically the housing bubble and what the bursting of the housing bubble has done to our global economy. It's been a really, a, it's been terrible to kind of watch all the destruction that it's caused. But I think it's also important just to understand bubbles. So I wanna, I wanna start this talk by just get, having a basic understanding of what, what a bubble is. And then leading into bonds, I want us all to just understand what, what bonds are, specifically U.S. Treasuries, and how, what an effect Treasuries and bond prices have on the price of every, everything, really, and how we, how we might buy or sell a home, the getting leasing, getting a car loan, or even getting to come to a school like this one, student loans. Um, so once, I've, once we've talked about those basic concepts, I want to talk to you more about the subtitle of my talk, How Rising Interest Rates Could Change the World as We Know It. Okay, so let's start off by, uh, oops. Oops, okay, sorry. Yes, let's start off with bubbles. So bubbles, first of all, are a byproduct of any functioning economy. Basically a market economy where supply, where consumers dictate the price, prices of things supply and demand. And we've seen bubbles in almost any asset class that can pop up in different areas throughout time. One of the first known bubbles ever was the tulip bubble in the 1600s. That's one of the first documented bu bubbles. We've seen them in the price of houses, bubbles. We saw them in dot-com stocks in the late 1990s. And we even saw them in Beanie Babies, this uh, stuffed animal, this little stuffed animal you might remember. Basically, a bubble in an asset class can happen any time the price gets way out of whack from the underlying value of the underlying demand for a product. And the, very, the scary thing about bubbles is that they're just very hard to spot. I mean, people might think that they see them, but in general, they're pretty hard to spot until they've popped. And then you start to see the damage, you start to see the prices fall precipitously. So, I'm just going to use Beanie Babies as an example. I think it's a, it's a small, it was a small market, a relatively small bubble, but I think it was just told us how, it's an easy way to explain how they happen. So basically, a bubble might spark, start to form. Prices of, an, of a, something like a Beanie Baby, a house, a dot-com stock, might start to increase because of a real demand for a product. For these Beanie Baby Babies, for example, the founder of the company famously wanted to keep the demand high, so he made them very hard to get. You had to go to specialty retail stores. He would release them in certain ways. 
release uh, a few at a time of different types of Beanie Babies. So suddenly there was demand for these Beanie Babies. The price started to rise. It was around the same time as eBay. You could buy things online. So people could really see the price going up and up and up. But what happens in a bubble is that something, at some point, the psychology of buying changes. So suddenly, people are not buying Beanie Babies because they want to have them, but they're paying 30, 40. The, the price keeps on going up because people think they, they want to speculate. It's an investment. They want to turn around, flip it, and sell it to the next person. So at, at some point in a bubble, there's this speculation mania of sorts that takes over. And prices rise and rise and rise. And then at some point, the opposite happens. People just start to question the underlying value. And the price starts to fall. And just as precipitously as it rises, prices fall dramatically. So with Beanie Babies, for example, one day in the late 1990s, they were selling for more than $1,000, these little uh, bears. And then suddenly, people couldn't even unload them for le the $5 retail price. So we saw the phenomena, it's different, but it plays out a similar way, whether it's in housing or tech stocks. And, um, it's, and then, the, but the real difference between a baby, Beanie Baby and a house um, or other, other bubbles we've seen is, is the ramifications of it. Beanie Babies, you got hurt if you owned them and you bought them. Tech stocks, it was much more broad, the ramifications. It did cause a recession, and the housing bubble, clearly when it popped, called it, caused a global financial panic. So bubbles come in different shapes and sizes, but they, they follow the same trajectory, the same basic patterns. All right, so let's move on to bonds. Um, so bonds, as you all know, there's essentially an IOU. You and I can take out a bond. You, we can borrow money. Governments can borrow money. Corporations can borrow money. The US government started borrowing money back in, the, in World War I. These are some of the first bonds that we saw. They're, they were called the Liberty Bonds. Back then, it was to pay for the war. Since then, as you all know, the government's become better and better and better at borrowing money. This, debt ceiling thing we're talking about. Now the limit for the government is $16.7 trillion. They have to get Congress to approve more. That's another story for another time. You can turn into CNN. They'll be talking about it a lot <laughs> over the next few weeks. But that said, the price, the treasury market, the government bond borrowing market, is one of the, lar it's the largest market in the whole entire world. And basically, with a bond, you promise when you borrow money, it's an IOU, you borrow a fixed amount of money to get it right now, and you promise to pay an interest rate back. If you and I want to borrow money, it's our credit scores, a lot of different factors come into play. When the US government wants to borrow money, there, until very recently, there was no question that the, of the safety of the US government. They were going to pay you back. It's just a question of other factors of how much people can get for treasuries and interest compared to other investments in the world. So basically, treasuries, there's a big auction market. There are decisions whether uh, how much the interest rates are paid for treasuries. But basically, because it's the safest market in the world, it's the lowest interest rate. And it's the interest rate that dictates the price of just about everything else. The mortgage rates are tied to it, auto loans, student loans. Um, okay, so when we talk about the potential bond bubble, it's very clear why people are getting worried when you think of treasury rates, interest rates. So this, this chart shows treasury yields, the 10-year yield is essentially the benchmark for treasuries. We're looking back through 1980. You can obviously see it's a little bit jagged, but the, pre the yield on treasury, the interest rates, has basically been going down since the late 1980s, uh, early 1980s. The interest rates were very high, almost much, much higher than they are now. So we're in a very different period. If you've invested in bonds any time over the last 30 years, you've basically made money. And it's, it's, it's very, uh, 
very dramatic. And just to be clear here, when we look at, as opposed to stock prices, or prices of many other things, treasury, we look at, we measure treasuries by yield. So when the yield goes down, it means prices are going up as demand goes up. So basically within the last year, we've seen prices at the treasury yields at the lowest level they've ever been. It hasn't always been this way. And look, if we look back through 1962, it was going up and up and up interest rates. So now we're on the other side of that curve. So this is what we're, what we're up against. So I just want to, when we, when we think of it in, in broad brush strokes, I just want to first just take a step back and have an understanding of why they matter, how they affect us. So again, low interest rates, broadly speaking, help students, you pay less for loans. Home buyer, you pay less per month for mortgages. Your monthly payments are down, your interest rates, it costs less to borrow. Same thing with if you want to buy, take out an auto loan. It's tough when you have money and you're saved up in your bank accounts. You don't get that much back because the interest rates are lower. Investing in bonds, you have a fixed amount of income and you're not getting that much for it. So again, as I mentioned, the treasury rates are very, uh, this is just back, um, this is back through the 60s, very, very highly correlated. If you take out a mortgage, the treasuries move up and down, mortgage rates move up and down. So let's, let's just take one, one example, just look at how dramatic the change in interest rates can be. So this is a beautiful house right here for sale in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. It's this $600,000 house, five bedroom, three bathroom house. So say, say you wanted to go and buy it back in 1982. And I'll just preface this by saying this isn't, clearly is not a fair comparison because in 1982 this house would have cost a lot less. But just to, just to benchmark this, so the same house, $600,000, generally speaking, people put 20% down. If you were to buy this house when mortgage rates were 16.6%, .6%, you'd be paying $7,310 every month. The total cost of the house would be $2.6 million over three, 30 years. Let's go to November 2012 when mortgage rates hit their lowest level ever, 3.3%. Look at how dramatically different the monthly payments would be, almost $5,000 difference. Instead of paying almost $3 million for that house, once you finally own it outright in 30 years, you're paying almost a million dollars. So it's a very, very different ball game with interest rates lower. So I, so, that's just one out of many ways it just hits all of our bottom line and the choices that we can make once we, um, once we, once interest rates ch change. Okay, so as we talk about the bond bubble, what it means, let's again look at why this has been happening. I mean, we've had this trajectory over 30 years or so of yields going down and down and down, but it's been, Dr very dramatic since the financial crisis. So you, you can somewhat see it. it. Some peaks and valleys, it's not quite as straight a line. But basically, so 2.63% is where we are now. But basically, rates have hit their lowest level ever. So, and so basically, over the last five years, you would have made about 5% on your investment in bonds. And then going back much longer than that, since the 80s, you just would have done well. They've, these have always been a safe, vanilla investment, but they're also somewhat lucrative. You don't have to worry. It's a good investment. But as rates just kept on getting beyond points where people said that they could ever get, why would anyone just park their money here if they were only going to get interest rates of 1.5%, 2%? Why wouldn't you just invest in something else? So let's look at why. Clearly, during the financial crisis, it was a very unprecedented event. It, it, was, it was terrifying to cover. I'm sure all of us just watching it were scared. I mean, we saw Lehman Brothers suddenly fail. Banks, were, other banks were maybe going to fail had the Federal Reserve, I mean, had the U.S. government not stepped in and given them this TARP money. So suddenly, 
the whole idea of safety. What, what is safe? Banks are supposed to be safe, but they could be <coughs> gone the next day. That whole idea of safety changed. So that's suddenly the, U, the US government treasuries have always been one of the safest investments in the world, but they became so much more important to buyers all over the world. We saw foreign governments making much bigger investments in them. Big banks were, it was an easy, safe place to park their money. And also because things had gotten so dicey with the banks, with credit, they were also mandated by the US government and other governments to be in safe assets. We saw individual investors put, since 2008, $1 trillion into bonds. So that, as we see supply and demand, why people are buying them, we've had this, it's this flight to safety in a way because the safety of the financial system was shaken in a way it never had been. There was just this idea that this is the place to go. But this, that is also, going back to the bubble, what makes this very different. When we talked about the bubbles, the tulip bubbles, the Beanie Baby bubbles, the psychology behind bond prices is very different here. Because people have not necessarily been buying bonds so they can turn them and flip them and make a good return. It's a place to park money. So there's some, some difference in the selling can still start at some point, but it's not the same really mania that we had. It was, it's more been a flight to safety. So again, as Nick and I were talking before, this question, bomb bubble, question mark. So let's keep on, let's keep on addressing the question. So I mentioned the first three, foreign governments, big banks, individual investors. The fourth group, the fourth buyer that I'll mention is the Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank. So the, that is our current Fed chairman, Ben Bernanke. And that, the Fed is, has been one of the biggest buyers of US treasuries. Right now, the Fed spends about a trillion dollars a year, $85 billion per month buying treasuries. So we, that is a huge difference when you think about bubbles. The Fed, since the financial crisis, has not just been buying them buying bonds is purely a flight to safety. It's also, the Fed has been buying bonds to keep interest rates low. All the things we, I mentioned before, they want people to take out mortgages. They want corporations to go out and spend money. When interest rates are low, it's tempting. So the Federal Reserve has purposely been buying these bonds to push, create demand, push prices lower and lower and lower. So we're still in the middle of this period of time. It's called, right now it's called quantitative easing three, QE3, where the Fed is buying bonds. So one reason not to panic is we just want, looking back at what the Fed has done since uh, they started talking about tapering. So tapering is what it's been called over the summer. Ben Bernanke was making statements saying, you know, we've been helping out the economy a lot. It's maybe getting back on track. There's a chance we might at some point taper. We might start buying fewer bonds than we were buying before. So the market has generally liked QE. It's the idea of easy money. So when Bernanke began his tape, so-called taper talk, this is what we saw happen to rates since May 2013. They basically shot up. People got scared. They said, oh, if this idea of the bond bubble really kicked in, they said, if maybe I should just sell now if I'm going to be losing money in bonds. We saw rates sh shoot up. Come September, Bernanke saw what was happening. Sorry if I have to go back. Yes. And uh, his Janet Yellen, as you may know, is expected to be his successor. It's not, not a sure thing. But both, both of them, Bernanke came back, they had a Fed meeting and said, you know, we're not going to taper now. We're just going to keep buying at the same pace. We're not completely sure about the state of the economy. So the rates dip back a little bit after this. Janet Yellen's expected to succeed um, Ben Bernanke. She's also thought to be very much of the same mon mindset of being, having this accommodative monetary policy. 
So a good reason not to panic is they don't have ultimate control over the price of bonds, but the Fed has a lot of control. And the Fed does not want rates to shoot up because they've seen what damage it could cause. They want the bond bubble to maybe, if it is a bubble, if prices are gonna rise, if interest rates are gonna rise, which they think they will, I think we all should expect that they will, they're gonna make sure to the extent that they can that it's done relatively slowly and safely. So Ben would like to, you know, to not panic. He wants the markets not to. It seems like that, that's one reason a lot of people think they held off on tapering, all this craziness in the government is probably another reason. So that gets me to what, what should you do to be prepared? I mean, if we, as I said, I, from so many people I talk to, economists, asset managers, very few people think the bond bubble is gonna pop. Of course, some people have talked about, have talked about rates shooting back to 5% in a terrifying way. But a lot of people think it's gonna be a much slower road, little by little by little. But that chart that we saw at the beginning, it's almost seen as an inevitable that we have seen the interest rates go down, down, down. At some point, they have to go up. We're at about 2.63% now. In general, the average interest rates have been about 5%. At some point, we're gonna live back in a world where interest rates are so-called normal. So be prepared. I mean, one thing, just to begin with, prices are gonna fluctuate, prices of housing. Whether or not you think we're in the housing recovery and it's gonna last for a long time, it's a good time to at least think about being prepared by locking in an interest rate. If you can lock in a 30-year mortgage, it's not a crazy, it's a smart time to think about it. Auto loans, student loans, of course, come up when you have a, you're in school. <laughs> you're not gonna just take one out at a random time. But the idea is, this is one way to be prepared. The second way, the m most important way, of course, is to rethink bonds. This is Warren Buffett, one of the most famous investors and successful investors in the world. This was back in 2010. Um, he said bonds should come with a warning label. He wasn't exactly right. He said this in his annual letter, and we saw prices go down after that. But his general principle, if you know Warren Buffett, he is a buy and hold investor. So I think his, his warning label comment is something that everyone should keep in mind very carefully. It's not bonds for 30 plus years have been this safe investment. Safe because they're an IOU and for the most part, you're gonna get paid back if it's, if it's treasuries, it's relatively safe corporate bonds, and you'll earn some interest, interest payments along the way and, and a return on top of it. What, what Warren Buffett was saying and what a lot of people have echoed and especially more and more and more now as we seem to be on the precipice of this turning point is that you can't think of bonds in the way that you always have and a big chunk of your portfolio that they're gonna be safe. They're gonna be simply protecting you this plain vanilla investment. Bonds are probably not gonna blow up. We saw how precipitously the stock market fell after the financial crisis. They're never gonna, it's very, very unlikely that you're gonna see a steep, steep, steep sell-off in bonds, but what you could be doing is eroding the value of your portfolio by holding too many. So it's, this of course is up to everybody. Everyone has a different portfolio structure of your own personal investments based on where you are in life and what, whether you wanna be much riskier or just sort of keep your retirement savings and your nest egg and just prolong it as long as possible. But from many financial planners I've talked to said, say it's a 60-40 allocation. You have 60% of your investments in stocks, 40% in bonds. Now is the time to do the rethinking. Rates over the long term, it might go up and down, will probably rise. Maybe now is the time to switch it from 70% stocks to 30% stocks. People have told me lately, you know, stocks are always thought to be risky, but now is the time that bonds are thought to be risky in a way they hadn't before. So I think 
it's, it's a very individualized, differentiated model, but it's the, t the time to scale back or rethink bonds is now. That said, no one should get rid of bonds in their portfolio. At the end of the day, even if the U.S. government defaults in two weeks, I won't, I won't make any claims on that because that is a really terrifying prospect. But bonds, no matter what, are, U.S. Treasuries are still the safest investment in the world. We saw how quickly the stock market can rise and fall. If we get into another financial panic, they'll still be safe, but they're just not the same investment, safe investment that they have been over the long term. So I guess coming, coming away from this, the two things I do really want you all to keep in mind, and these two ideas, I would just say listen to, think about Ben, but listen to um, Buffett. Ben Bernanke will probably do his best and his successor to keep you safe from this bond bubble. But keep Warren Buffett's investment advice in mind. Bonds should come with a warning label. They're not what they have been throughout time. They're gonna change. So thank you all very much tonight. I appreciate it. I'm very happy to take questions. All right, so could my uh, finance uh, club folks go around and collect our questions? Uh, we'll start off with one uh, to kind of, while, while we're uh, sending questions around. What would you consider normal interest rates? So you said you know, they'll, they'll, they'll kind of move to a more normal yield. What are you talking about? What are you envisioning? And about how far off do you see this occurring? Normal interest rates over time for, for, are roughly four to five percent. So that's significantly closer to five percent, significantly above where they are now. It seems like this will take years to happen if, if this bond bubble is not exactly a bubble, there's no pop, but just a very, very slow controlled deflation. I think it could be years and I think it could stay somewhat jagged. I mean, we might see things move, but I think the overall trajectory will be on the upswing for several years. So until we get the other questions, I have one here. Uh, this would be kind of a doomsday. What if there is an action, a very massive sell-off? Can you envision a situation where this might occur? I think, I mean, I think you, I, to be fair, you have to. I think that there is a possibility. It's tricky, though, because if there is a massive sell-off, you can also envision a way in which bond prices kind of go, could shoot up and then could come back down, meaning that it could, if there, if rates really shot up, it could just really unsettle the whole economy. So, you know, if, if say if that happened, if we saw rates shoot up next week to five, six percent, I think it would really Cut, ha, force people to cut back. We've, we're starting to see the housing rebound. People are going out and buying houses. That might stop. Home prices might fall. So you could kind of see, you could see, envision a scenario where rates rise really quickly and then people's portfolios get hurt. So everyone's just pulling back. Corporations are pulling back. And then because of that, bond prices maybe fall because of this panic again. So. There are a lot of ways it could play out, but I could envision that as a scary scenario. What is the future of tax exempt municipal bonds and uh, bond funds? So, your thoughts on that? So, tax exempt muni funds are in, it's a pretty interesting time right now um, because of Detroit. So, munis, uh, they had a doomsday prognosticator in Meredith Whitney. Um, I don't know if you all remember her. She was like, she really called the financial crisis. She seemed, she's an analyst, very smart. She saw that the banks were gonna have a lot of problems. So people listened to her. And I think it, it was in 2011, she said, okay, states and municipalities are having major, major problems with their finances. I think the muni bond world is gonna totally blow up. Everyone's gonna get crushed. And I mean, as you know, a lot of pension funds are invested in munis, a lot of individuals, tax exempt. That didn't happen. 
it's they she actually per caused a rush of money out of muni bonds as soon as she said something so it really changed the price but we ha we haven't seen major defaults until this year we saw De detroit default so once again a lot of people have gotten spooked on muni bonds that said i don't think i think with taxes increasing the economy's recovering there's just a lot less fear overall in the muni market. Detroit's going to be, a, seems a lot more like a one-off situation. I mean, we saw smaller cities default. We saw Harrisburg. Um, but I don't think people right now are predicting this huge wave of muni defaults as long as the economy keeps on going. I think we're still too early in the cycle. I mean, I think there are certain parts of the country where it's seeming a little bubbly. I live in Brooklyn. It's kind of, kind of insane there. I, I don't know. But I think it seems things had gotten down so far that for now, at least, people think that the rush to refinance or to really take out new mortgages is simply part of this housing rebound and a necessary one, and they think there's still room to go. Here's one I, uh, I'm going to add a bit to it, I think. Just, uh, how can one differentiate between a normal, strong economy and one inflated by quantitative easing? In other words, uh, is the quantitative easing, I think, propping up the economy? And if so, is that a good thing or, or a bad thing? It's a, it's a dicey thing. I mean, there's this sense of, um, I mean, people, I know people have talked about our economy, it's like drug addicts, that the quantitative easing is the drug that's uh, being given, and are we completely addicted to it? And is, there, or is everything just going to fall apart when it's let go? It's, I honestly, Nick, I'm really curious to hear your opinion. I think it's just very early to say things are humming along. I think there's a lot of questions of why aren't things better. The stock market's way up this year. It's up between 18 and 25%. But unemployment is not going down. The unemployment rate's not going down as fast as people thought it would, or we're not adding jobs. I mean, the unemployment rate's actually going down, but the jobs added, a lot of that's because people are dropping out of the workforce. I think the signs of a healthy economy aren't there which is wh another reason that Ben Bernanke said they didn't taper. I mean, he said that they're just, it's not humming on all cylinders, the things are getting better. So I think as of now, it's, I mean, a big question mark. Things are getting better. It is a Fed-fueled easing of our economy into a healthy state. So Nick, what do, what do you think about this? Oh, no, oh I thought you were going to add in your, your own no, thoughts on this one. Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think, again, it's a really mixed bag. Um, as we saw, I mean, you'll pay, pay more for your mortgage, you'll pay more for your student loan, but the, the downside of these low interest rates environment is that it's tough for savers, it's tough for people who have spent their whole lifetime building up a nest egg, and uh, they're not gonna be aggressive, they don't wanna go out there and spend, put all their money in stocks, and they just, suddenly see the value of their portfolio being eroded because interest rates are so low. So, and interest rates are obviously also low right now because the economy is not back where we want it to be. So, the, once interest rates go higher, I think everyone should want them to go higher, especially Bernanke, the Federal Reserve, the central bankers. They do want them eventually to get higher because that means we're in a healthy economy. And, that basically the economy doesn't on life support. I mean, this, these, this low interest rate environment has been a life support of sorts for the economy. So once people, if we have four to five percent interest rates, eventually corporations are, bar are borrowing money because they just see growth out there in the future. People are buying houses because they have a job that pays well and they want to get a new house for real reasons, not because of artificially low interest rates. 
eventually, if it's done in the right way and it's not a very extreme snap, I think it will be a good thing. Uh, this one's uh, kind of an interesting question. Is there uh, a correlation between 10-year treasuries, uh, the dollar, and emerging market equities and bonds? I'm not, I'm not sure. Is that correct? Uh, I... So I guess uh, I'm going to take the question more from the emerging markets. Yeah, I think, I think that's what they're asking. Yeah. So um, emerging markets have been really uh, up and down. Um, I'm not a, as much of an expert on them, but I know I'll just say lately as this talk of tapering has been happening, I mean, a lot of different things are happening in all different parts of the world. But there is this question that the low interest rates there's this idea that they've been really helping 10-year treasuries, helping emerging economies because uh, people are more willing to take risks, they're more willing to invest in different parts of the world. So it was pretty weird to see, as like the taper talk happened, people started freaking out more in and pulling money from emerging economies. So it seemed like it was gonna have a more outsized impact on emerging economies. We started to see things drop faster in the reaction, more extreme than in U.S. equities, and it actually made people kind of pull their money more into the U.S. stock market and out of foreign markets. So here's a, a question from, I think, one of our students. Uh, you know, it's a great idea to invest young, so any of the fluctuations that occur in the market will work themselves, work themselves out over time. Uh, is this true for bonds? Or uh, as a young investor, should, a, um, should they invest in bonds now, trusting that they go down and they go up, or is it not the same as investing in stocks? I think especially right now, if you're a young investor and you can uh, withstand a lot more volatility, it's don't count out bonds, don't not invest in them. But it seems like you should be even more heavily weighted towards stocks now because you can ri really ride out the roller coaster. But over time, I'm not going to make any promises. The S and P, the Dow, we should see it with some ups and downs. We've seen it over time continue to go up. And I think it would be a dangerous thing as a young investor to just catch the other side of that chart that I showed you. So I would, I think it's always thought that. Um, Young investors should be a little bit more aggressive, be weighted towards stock, take more risks. You have the potential to make big returns if you can just buy and hold and ride out the waves. But it seems like in this environment, you should do that even a little bit more so. So how do you think the government shutdown and uh, the debt ceiling talk affect interest rates and bonds, if at all? So that's a, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, so let's say the, the shutdown, uh, the last two days, I think the stock market's been down a little bit. People don't think the shutdown is gonna stock, affect the stock market very much. Um, I think bond rates have gone down a little bit. The crazy thing, so, but I'll address the debt ceiling, that's the much more scary thing. So if, if, we, if the Congress fails to agree on the debt ceiling, people don't think, they're, think they'll reach an agreement before October 17th because it's so terrifying what could happen if they don't. The U.S. government will essentially default on its debt, which has never happened before, ever. And so that idea of, you know, the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, we're going to have to start to question that. And even if it's just for a short time, it's just kind of piercing this veil that they're doing the unthinkable. There's never any thought that the government could default, but they might. The cr absolutely crazy thing from most people, I've, most economists I've talked to, and maybe this could play out slightly differently, is they think, again, that U.S. Treasury prices will fall. Because even if the government is suddenly more risky than it was yesterday, it's still the safest environment, still the safest uh, bond, the safest asset in the world, so people will, like, oddly enough, still want to own it. It'll just, it could upset everything else, but it could actually drive rates down. And, we, and just uh, going back, we saw that during uh, when the S&P downgraded the U.S. credit rating. So in theory, again, our debt's less safe, but people all bought into it. It just shook up 
the world economy again. So it's, it's, a, it's a counterintuitive idea, but everyone I talk to thinks it's going to drive treasury prices down. But let's all hope that it doesn't happen because it's so many other really terrifying things could happen. It almost violates you know, one of the laws of finance. It's riskier and the price goes up. Right? Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, OK, so we will uh, end with a good political question. Uh, is there a reason that uh, because of the bubble and the potential uh, damage that it could do, should Congress get involved and change the system before the uh, Wait, uh, can you can you say uh, what what exactly is meant by change what system? I, I'm not, I'm not the sure Fed. <laughs> that I, I don't know. Is there some law that we can enact to prevent the bubble from bursting, <laughs> or prevent future bubbles? Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Some people like Ron Paul have mentioned that before, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Fed is separate. It's not, I mean, some people say more and more it's answering to Congress. They're, they're technically completely independent and make independent decisions about monetary policy. So I, it's, uh, it's unclear what specifically Congress could do. Um, I heard one really crazy thing. I don't, I don't know if this, like, is exactly this, but that pu that Congress could think about using tax money to pay down our national debt. It's a, l a little bit <laughs> separate, but <laughs> it's never been done before. But I think someone told me it was a hedge fund manager told me it was technically legal to sort of circumvent the Fed that way. But um, I don't know. It's a, it's a tricky conundrum about how po politically you can get involved. But well, are there any last questions?